Hello, everyone, and welcome to Film Independent Presents, our year-round screening and Q&A series, now virtual and in person, a little bit of a hybrid approach. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today to talk all things Homeroom. First off, I'd like to thank some of our supporters, our lead sponsor, HFPA, and official partner, Vision Media. Um, for today's Q&A, we are very happy to bring back one of our favorite moderators. You know her as the Kirby Critic, aka Carla Renata. And without further ado, I will let Carla take it from here. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate that so very much. Well, you guys, today we are in for a treat because we have the director and producer of this wonderful documentary that is being streamed right now on Hulu called Home Room. Welcome. We are a part of the Youth Outreach Unit of the Oakland Police Department. Do you think it's necessary to make assumptions about anybody you come in contact with? Uh, good question. My name is Zeno Singaribo, and I'm one of the two students that represent all 36,000 students in our district. We have some cuts which will impact our students. Oh. The district spends $6 million on police. We don't really feel safe with police. It could be very triggering. I don't really feel like they do anything to serve or protect us. Let's go, gentlemen. The bell has run. I would love for you to come to a board meeting because I don't be seeing young people. We should cut police from our schools and redirect that money into programs that are going to support young people. Time for you to listen to the community. The time to make history stand with us black and brown students is not tomorrow, it's today. I want to welcome to the stage, to the virtual stage, to the virtual screen, Mr. Peter Nix, a.k.a. Pete. How you doing? Hey, Carla. How are you? I'm good. So before we get into the discussion, I can't let you be a Howard University bison and not acknowledge that. I hate you. Hello. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just get those niceties out of the All way. Right. And I, I want to. Yes. And I want to say that when I was growing up, I was a military brat. So I didn't have a homeroom because I bounced around from school to school. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, did you have a homeroom when you were growing up? Yeah, I, I did when I was younger, you know. Um, I think when you get up into the sort of older sort of grades, um, you, you don't have so much, but it's interesting because that title, it's been the title of the film probably for two and a half years, maybe three years. I, I, I sort of a little bit of a play off of The Waiting Room, which was the first in the trilogy. Um, and then of course it became prophetic in a way that um, that these students en en ended up at home. So I, it's funny how, how, how that kind of worked out. Yeah, let's talk about that for a second. It is funny how they ended up at home um, and literally having their home room be in their room at home. I was wondering how challenging it how challenging was it, excuse me, for you to make that drastic shift? Because you, I'm sure as a filmmaker, you have a plan and you have a goal in mind. And then something like coronavirus, AKA COVID-19 throws a wrench in it. How, how did you make that shift to end up with the film that you did? Because I think it, it probably turned out a little bit better than you probably thought it was originally going to turn out. I mean, it was always going to be good now, don't get me wrong, but, <laughs> but because you have these students that are so vocal about their place in the world in in school and in life, you now have them speaking out for something completely different. So if you could just speak to that for a second, that would be great. Yeah. Well, the film, you know, the film, every documentary, takes its own path and you very rarely end up where you began. And it was the same for um, the prior film we did about the Oakland Police Department took, had a radical sort of twist uh, that led to us having to recut the film just a couple months before our Sundance premiere. Um, and so that, that, that to some degree that's part of the, the journey is, is uh, life life intervening. Um, uh, this film began in a very uh, different place, I, I, I guess you could say. Um, it was gonna be more about the exploration of the emotional lives of kids. And I kind of grew up with all the j movies of the 80s, like Breakfast Club and 
Ferris Bueller's Day Off and Pretty. Oh, Indian I did Bell. too. I love those yeah. films. Yeah. And, you know, those are mostly from the perspective of white suburban kids. Um, any kids of color who showed up and they were often caricatures. And I didn't even, you know, it's funny, like even being at Howard didn't give me that full insight. I think it wasn't until sort of the last um, 15 years or so as sort of conversations around representation and culture and media really got me understanding on a deeper level, sort of the significance of framing and sort of how we see our communities and how we reflect each other. And so I, you know, and being the father of, you know, mixed race kids, being mixed race myself, Oakland being an incredibly diverse city that reflects America in so many ways, we wanted to explore the emotional lives of, you know, young kids of color. And so that's um, wh where we began. And of course, I, you know, I'd struggled for many years, you know, with my daughter, raising my daughter who struggled with depression and anxiety, and she passed away at the you know onset of filming. And that really, you know, at, at one point we we're going to cancel the project, but then we decided, you know, for a whole variety of reasons for myself personally to, to continue um, to want to honor, you know, her and also speak to the, the what's at stake in terms of, you know, the, the uh, mental health of, of our young people of color. Um, they're carrying so much, you know, personal individualized traumas um, that are individualized and personal, but also collective uh, community trauma, generational trauma. Um, that 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 we knew we wanted to kind of explore that. So for you know for COVID to hit in, in the middle of uh, a film, you know about the emotional lives of young people, suddenly was this this notion of holding this collective and 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 reflecting this collective trauma and loss that we were, we were all experiencing. So the film started to have to you know step into that space. Let's talk a little bit about how the music shaped the project, because I know you used a song by Gawapale, mm -hmm. who I love as an artist. And mm -hmm. she's also um, someone who is an Oakland born and bred um, artist. What types of decisions did you make in terms of deciding what type of music to use for a documentary of this type? Well, you know, the, the trilogy, it's really interesting. It's uh, each film has its own DNA. And, and the waiting room was very um, spare on the music. You know, it was very experiential. Um, it had a lighter touch. Uh, it did have some voiceover from the characters. Um, the Force had very kind of intense music. It kind of like, like a Michael Mann kind of feel to, to, to the movie. It just felt like we, we always ask the film to sort of teach us what, what it wants to be, you know. Um, and we kind of try to make the decisions accordingly and think back to what is the theme? What is this film about? And then make all of our decisions accordingly. Accordingly. Yeah, that makes sense because the waiting room is in a hospital, takes yeah. place in a hospital. And then the force is dealing with, you know, Oakland and the police department and stuff like that. So it makes sense that each portion of the trilogy has its own identity in terms of subject matter and music. So thank you yeah. for, you know, indulging me with, with the answer to that question. Yeah, but homeroom, to, 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 I didn't finish. The most oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. The most important part is that, you know, the decision for homeroom, the music in homeroom and, and the decision for Guapale was all about this, the, the community itself. And, and Guapale is, is a sort of local legend. Um, we wanted to have that connection. I've never done an original song for a do for a documentary, just score. And so this was an original song that we produced for the for the film. It's a different process, but it was it was part of and tied into um, the story of that community. And so that was sort of the intention behind that. Cool. Thank you for that. And sorry for the interruption. I thought you were done. <laughs> no, it's all good. <laughs> good. Um, I have a question from the audience from Jonathan Schwartz. He says there are many important issues raised in this film. Have you talked to any of the subjects of the film since its release and what impact has it had on their lives since that time? Oh yeah, you know, I, I develop a pretty close relationship with all the people that have been in my documentaries over the years. Going back to little Danny Kramer, who I filmed when he was in thir 13 years old in, in middle school. And I, 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 I know him today, he's a, he's, a, he's a grown man, you know, and I've watched him grow up and it's really a profound relationship you have. Um, we, we just released the film. So all, all you know, the, the young 
you know, they're not kids anymore. <laughs> they're, 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 they're young people, adults, young leaders uh, have been participating in the Q and A's and stepping out, doing interviews. Uh, we, we, we brought in two of them, Dwayne Davis and Dennis and Garibo as, as our summer interns. I just started a company with Ryan Coogler and uh, proximity media. So Dwayne was our first, one of our first interns. Uh, and then I, I also run a nonprofit. That's the umbrella for my for my trilogy. And and Denelson was our was our summer intern for Open Openhood. So we you know we brought them in, and we we like to try to um, you know stay connected to the community, and and that that's one way to do it. Can we talk a little bit about Openhood? Can you tell the audience what that is and how you all collaborated to make that happen? I I started it um, with the thinking that the films wouldn't exist in isolation, that the films would be part of a broader community outreach effort, that these films were part and parcel of the story of, of Oakland, which was also the story of America in so many ways. And so um, we had a variety of initiatives built around our films. This, with The Waiting Room, we did this big storytelling project um, that was sort of concurrent with the film. And so the, the, the nonprofit just kind of exists to both produce the films and also to be a conduit um, to connecting with stakeholders around a variety of issues from access to healthcare to criminal justice reform to education. Cool. One of the two things in the film that um, struck me to my core, the first one was the issues surrounding defund the police because there is a lot of misinformation out there about what that phrase means. Mm -hmm. And people didn't, I think this is a great tool to introduce to them what it really means and what people say, what people mean when they say it. That's so right. I loved that you guys addressed that and you addressed it very thoroughly. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that I, I also love <laughs> how you comedically to a certain extent addressed how the kids were being all stressed out and excited over getting into college and taking those tests. And let me just say that I did not even know until I watched Homeroom that you got a hundred points just for writing your name. I hollered out loud. I was like, oh, wow. So I got a hundred points just for writing my name. <laughs> I had no idea. And I loved how he was so he was so annoyed. He thought he had really done something until that one guy said, yeah, you just got 100 points for writing your name. He's like, oh, I did that bad. That made yeah. me laugh. Right. That was yeah. funny because it was with a with a documentary like this. You need something light every once in a while just to kind of elevate the mood a little bit so that it's not too laying in one space. Don't you yeah. think? I, I, I totally agree. I mean, the, the, you know, those things, those little moments do a lot of things simultaneously. They, they can make you laugh. They, you know, it's a little bit of recognition. They also have something to say about sort of how we judge and value the potential of our young people. And, you know, that we have this distorted sense of, you know, how seeing these young people getting, you know, marginal scores on their SATs. And then at the same time, you know, the resilience that they show and the courage that they show and, and, and to rise up out of, you know, such a, uh, difficult moment to sort of show themselves and to raise their voice is quite remarkable to sort of see that ju juxtaposition. So we're hoping that, you know, this can be part of, uh, you know, a conversation around rethinking how we are supporting our young people and who we are, who we're choosing to support and who, who has potential, you know. Absolutely. I love the scenes in the, the boardroom meetings too, especially the one where they took that vote and Dennis was not having that. This is what I love most about homeroom it shows because i i'm not gonna lie for me personally sometimes when i walk outside my door or i'm out in public i see these young people and i'm like oh lord i'm really worried about what's gonna happen in the world moving forward if these are the people that are in charge of it which is a really judgmental statement to make mm -hmm. but having said that when i watched homeroom it gave me hope for the future because I saw a group of kids that were not afraid to speak out, not afraid to speak up. And when I was in school, you couldn't do that. Right. Right. No. Right. You couldn't <laughs> speak up like you couldn't speak up and out like that. You'd get suspended. Your mm -hmm. parents would ground you, put you on punishment. All kinds of little crazy things would happen when you when you did that. Yeah. Now we live in a society and a time and culture and in the world where the only way you can 
see change and make change is by speaking up and speaking mm-hmm. out. Yeah. So I was happy to see that you showed these kids doing that in a positive, constructive way and not a destructive way. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a little bit of both, right? It's like, you know, social media is, is play, it can play a destructive role in the lives of young people. It's so ubiquitous and so, you know, toxic in, in, in so many ways, but I think what adults don't fully understand, and this is sort of that disconnect that, 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 the, that the, you know, students were talking about a- after that scene, after they came out of that board meeting and they were saying, Hey, there's a disconnect between us and adults. And I don't think adults fully understand that young people are, are, coming of age in ways that are unprecedented in their own spaces, in their own ways, gathering information, trading information, communicating with each other, completely absent any adult supervision. And yes. I think that, that's a completely new thing. Adults don't understand. Um, and, and so young people are now stepping forward when they're given the opportunity to raise their voice, to, to organize, to uh, create change. Adults are like, shocked that, that, that they have these, uh, the awareness, the wherewithal, the maturity, the courage, um, and the, and the skills, like these are just fundamental organizing skills and that, that, that they can use to achieve, um, their goal, their goals. You know why we're shocked because we see this, <laughs> you know what I mean? You look up and this is all you see. Which- it's true. And it's both. And it's like, you have some of the, you know, the influencers and, you know, they're, they're, taking selfies and, and, and exactly. they're, doing, they're doing that, but they're also absorbing information. They're watching videos of, you know, police brutality or they're looking at articles and some of that stuff is, is crap. Some of it is like conspiracy theories and nonsense. And they're somehow navigating and filtering all this stuff. And it's a, it's going to be a process for them as they grow and as they mature to sort of decide what, what is meaningful and, and, and what is not. But I think adults, don't give them enough credit for making some of those some some of those choices. That doesn't mean along the way there isn't going to be some some <laughs> some chucklehead. <laughs> it, it 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 both are happening at the same time, and that's part of what we wanted to communicate. In the film. And you did that. You did that absolutely exquisitely. I have to say, because I there were the scenes where there were kids looking at their phone. There was one scene in particular where there was a kid looking at his phone, and I think there was some news. Um, news items or alerts popping up about the coronavirus. And he saw that he swiped that away. And then the the coronavirus thing was on his screen. And he literally was like, yeah, I'm done with that. And went to play a video game. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, you saw that, but then you saw the other ones who were watching that one kid getting swung around in a classroom by a teacher and how that kid got arrested. And you see them communicate how they feel about that. And you see them communicate how they feel about black and brown people being marginalized and triggered by having police officers around all the time. There was one moment where somebody actually said, somebody's parents said the police, they don't feel protected by the police. They, 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 they feel just the opposite. Mm. And I don't, I can't, I can't imagine a world where, a, where you go to school as a student and you can't concentrate on your studies because you're feeling triggered by seeing somebody in uniform in the hallway, not knowing if they got a wild hair up there behind that day or not, and they're gonna target you. That's frightening. And no child should have to go to school like that. You bring up so many different issues that I'm hoping when adults see it and kids too, that they see it for what it is and that they take action. That is That Homeroom is not just a film that you watch and you tell your friends about, but a film that you watch and you tell somebody else and they tell somebody else and they tell somebody else so that we can have systematic change within the school system, within the school board system, within the local police departments, which brings me to this. How challenging was it for you to film those board meetings and to film that meeting that happened with the Oakland PD where they would like, ask us any question you want, we'll answer any question you want, but, but were they really? No. You know, part of part of our sort of the value proposition of my work is that it's taken place in one community over time, you know, over 15 years, and I've developed relationships, trust, I've been able to, to get access to make this movie, I, I was able to show my prior films, invite the community, invite teachers, parents, students, allow them to watch my work, 
question me, allow me to ask them what they want, you know, in a story about the education system. So that that's a very valuable um, thing for any anyone, any filmmaker, because access is so important. And um, the public, the, the meetings are relatively easy to film because they're public. Anyone can show up there and film them. What's hard is the intimate moments. So like after the meeting and when the kid, kids went outside, to, uh, they initially didn't want us to film them. So it, there was a negotiation actually between us, us and my my associate producer actually was a graduate of Oakland High. And, and in that moment, we kind of gained a lot of respect for those young people because they were very strategic and very careful <laughs> about, about sort of deciding. They, they knew who we were because we had been filming in the school, but they didn't fully understand kind of what we were doing. And nor, nor did we at that point. That was early in the year before COVID hit and all, and all that. We knew we just wanted to follow Dendelson because he was a he sat on the school board representing the 36,000 students. And, and we figured that would just reveal something if we just, you know, you know, but we were also following kids who are not leaders, kids who are dropouts, stoners, jocks, you know, influencers. What we that was the, the Breakfast Club idea. Um, and then, you know, um, it's a sort of case by case basis trying to sort of get access into those little moments that that are revealing that are revealing for an audience. There was a one little moment that that was so funny to me. There's a moment where there's a conversation happening, but the camera stays on this one black kid's face who has on a black hoodie and has friends mm -hmm. across his sweatshirt. Friends, yeah. the one show on television that barely had any representation Isn't whatsoever. That, that like, made like, me like, laugh. I was like, love, wow. Kids of color love that show. It's, it's bizarre. My daughter, that was one of my daughter's favorite shows. And I was like, I, I, I'm like really? <laughs> I don't know how that happened. That was that for whatever reason that stood out to me. I'm like, wow, he's got a black. And it, it wasn't that he had on a black hoodie. It was the fact that he had the black hoodie on and had the hoodie up over his head. Yeah, yeah. And had yeah. friends on there. I'm like, there's a lot going on there. <laughs> there's, a, there's a whole lot of subliminal messaging going on there. But I love I love seeing stuff like that, yeah, because yeah. to me, that's the earmark of some really great filmmaking. I loved that. Love that so much. I also loved how. um you guys didn't shy away from the images and the stories about people like Mia Wilson, who was stabbed and killed um, in a park. And oh, one of the park. adult, yeah, and in a, an adult saying, she is not a hashtag. This was a human being that was murdered and killed by a white person in cold blood. Like, this ish is real. This yeah. is not, this is not some something that's just a social media story. And I love how there was the memorial of all the kids that I'm not sure if they had graduated or if they didn't get to graduate. Like, what was the montage of all those kids on the board? Are, not the black and white one, but the ones with all the different colored pictures. The, that was just the board, the big board. Yeah, the big one. Uh -huh. like after COVID hit and we showed the those are just all the students at the school and just sort of seeing that montage or seeing telling the story of, of, of that school to very interesting uh, demographic and in that it's incredibly diverse, but, but for the fact that there are almost zero, no white kids. It's about one third Hispanic, one third black, one third Asian mixed in with, you know, non-English speaking refugees. Um, but the community in which it, it, it sits is rapidly gentrifying. And so you see the, the, the tours that come through are mostly white families saying, oh, this is the local school. Let me go check this out. Then they go, they, they check it out. And then like, oh, okay, no, no, thank you, next. Wow. So it, 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 it's a very fascinating, we could have made a whole second film on that. And we actually, we were exploring that at one point. And that tour, when that tour comes in, what do you, what do you see? You see a police car sitting on the, 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 the basketball court. And so it, there's a lot of sort of complex um, things happening there but we just you know a lot of times in my films it's I like to just see the faces I, I usually have a montage at the end of my movies of, of the faces of people that you've seen um, just close in um, just to remind everyone of that that we're, we're what we're ultimately trying to do is see each other um, and by extension allow ourselves to see ourselves in the in the, in the world around us maybe differently yeah. I love that montage at the end of all of them on their social media, kind of moving on with their lives post graduation in the middle of a pandemic and how 
all of them made really good use of that time and tried to stay positive either by connecting with each other or connecting to whoever they were dealing with in the social media world via yeah. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Zoom, whatever it was. I love that yeah. you showed that because yeah. um, it was important. It was important to show that the communication was still happening, that they didn't get so caught up in what was happening globally that it killed their their fighting spirit. Yeah. Um, and I love how they were like, you know, know your power and claim it. Mm. I love that's going to be my new mantra. I was so excited about that. I was like, yes, know your power and claim it. Know what that is. Then they marched on her house. The mayor said that. And then they marched on her house. (laughs) Right. I love that. I was like, I was like, yes, get it. Um, I also want to talk about, you had mentioned earlier um, and my, my prayers for you and your family at the loss of your daughter. So Mm. sorry to hear about that. How did your daughter's passing ultimately um, change the trajectory of the film? Because you, I think I read somewhere that, and you said here that you were contemplating stopping it, mm-hmm. but these were her peers and her friends. Mm-hmm. So what made you continue to go as opposed to stop? Was it just to, to honor her memory and, sure. and to tell their story in the process? I'm not sure. I mean, we had got we had gotten going, and I'd hired you know, the crew, and you know, sh- uh, so it was a small crew. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, actually, the first thing that we did was they helped they all helped produce the memorial service for Karina, and we you know made a video and showed that. And I, I think for me, uh, I just needed something to do, uh, you know, in those sort of early days, just to kind of help get me through. Um, I did take a step back in a sense I didn't shoot the film. normally I shoot my own films because I just like that connection I have to the frame um but you know Sean he shot second camera on the force and he he you know kind of came of age in a sense he had just graduated from Berkeley's journalism program um, when he when we, we hired him for the force and Aww. um we you know we just had him look at a lot of footage of the waiting room in the force and I, I kind of think the way he shot it is kind of the way I would have shot it. And, and so that was really the only major difference. Um, and then it, it, you know, I did feel compelled initially, we were much more focused on the mental health piece. We are going to do another project much, much more um, picking up on, you know, the idea of adolescent mental health. Cause the, the, the system is what we discovered in trying to get help for our daughters is that the system's totally broken um which is an extension of what we the story we told in in the waiting room about the the overall healthcare system so um that that that's something that um you know pushed me through and and help help me re- remind me that you know her story that matters not not just to us but to a lot of people and all these kids that are in the movie were, were a reflection of her she would have been one of those kids at at the at the mar rally yeah those were all her friends and stuff so um it, it was a special, you know, thing that we could dedicate the film to her and, you know, it, it could be in her memory. I think that was, it. this was a lovely tribute to her. She, she would have been elated as is everyone that, that sees the film. Um, I want to talk to you about, you spoke about your collaboration with Sean and how you reached back into the alumni bucket and, and helped him out. But how did you end up collaborating with Gabby? Gabby um, also was a graduate of the Berkeley documentary program. Um, and uh, we heard about, we were looking for another associate producer. And then, I mean, we were looking for a associate producer and we heard that she went to Oakland High and that that kind of sealed it. Cause I, I like to, you know, even though I've lived in the Bay Area longer than anywhere that I've lived in my life at this point, <laughs> more than my second home. Um, you know, I wasn't born and raised here and I like to try to have as much connection, have the tellers of the story, the observers, um, have as much connection to the communities that we're, you know, um, immersing into as possible. So she, she, uh, as soon as I met her, I knew that she was perfect uh, for the, for the project. And, you know, now, now she's, you know, working with me at, at, at Ryan Coogler's company and 
we're continuing um, on in, the, in that way. But um, yeah, it was really, it was a very small crew. It was just me, Sean, Gabby, and Maya. Uh, okay. Maya Oprah Street was a young production assistant who had just, I think she just graduated high school. <laughs> she was very young and, and, um, and uh, it, it was kind of perfect for what we were trying to do. Look at you training them young. I love it. Oh yeah. I love building I love up it. the next generation. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, like, I'm like Mateen, you know, the, the principal of the school, he's like, I'm an old man. Like, I, I'm, <laughs> Like, this is this is y'all young people you got you know this is this is your turn you know sometimes I, i'm only 53 but some some days i'm like i was man. gonna say you are far from being an old man but i'm i'm gonna let you take that mantle if you want to keep it compared to these 16 17 year men these 16 17 year olds they're going it's unbelievable it's a wonderful thing so we've talked about how you collaborated with gabby and sean how did you hook up with ryan Ryan, so when I, you know, when the waiting room came out, Ryan was working on Fruitvale Station and someone at the San Francisco Film Society said, hey, you should meet Pete. You know, he just made this film about Highland. He was trying to get access to shoot at Highland. Uh, Oscar Grant, um, who's the subject of Fruitvale Station, was, yes. was born and died at Highland. Yes. And um, so I helped him get some access and then I helped him connect him to some some financing to help him finish the movie. And we just became as soon as I met Ryan you know he's like kindred spirit you know he's like kind of a geek he was talking about like can't just the way he talks and presents himself is is um unique and he he was somebody that I just wanted to try to support and help in any way that I could and then we just developed a relationship and you know the rest is history yes it is it truly is history um Bill H says, very good film. Maybe I missed this earlier, but are there any plans to do a follow-up in a few years to see where many of these kids wind up and what they do? Now, I mentioned, I know you mentioned doing a follow-up in terms of the mental health aspect, but are you going to do a specific follow-up with the kids that were featured in Homeroom? You know, it's interesting. Um, we're looking at doing follow-ups on... Um, a lot of the project, every project that, you know, from the waiting room to the force of this film has the potential for a follow-up. And one of the things that I learned uh, when I was in graduate school, I did an internship at Nightline. And this was back in the day when, you know, Nightline was like, it was at the peak of its powers in the, in the late 90s. Um, really phenomenal journalism and storytelling were happening over there, led by um, Tom Batag and Ted Koppel and a bunch of really smart sort of young producers. Um, yeah, I remember those days. <laughs> yeah, and, and they, they, would, they would go back to communities and, and individual people over time, and they would, they would track them over time. And, and I think it's an incredibly valuable tool, you know, in, in journalism and storytelling. And so I think the potential is there. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, I'm keeping a very close eye. Um, I'm in, con you know, the... the um, I'm close with all the folks over at Highland Hospital. My my wife works there. Um, the the captain who was in the the force, the African American captain, is now the chief of police. You know at the OPD. So I, I have the opportunity to you know continue these stories, and I and I hope to do that. And I just I just it's all about sort of waiting for for the right time. When's the right time? That enough time has passed that you know something new can be said or some some new insight can be gathered. Um, from whether it's reform, institutional reform, uh, questions around, um, you know, the impact, for instance, of these events of COVID-19 and of this moment in our history, racial awakening or reckoning with our own history and young people carrying that and how that's going to influence them, that the impact of the film itself, it's, it's an un, unusual thing to be a young leader and have your work captured and reflected on this stage that that surely has some kind of impact and so it'd be very interesting to see okay does Denelson become a politician does Dwayne become a filmmaker you know like how how what, what is the tra trajectory of their lives going to be but um I'll I'll make a note note to self it's noted and uh and hopefully hopefully I can bring br bring that story uh down the road and I also, um, with my last question, want to talk about the imagery that you used by capturing 
you know, the bodegas, the street art in Oakland and, and all those things that allow us to see the neighborhood and the people as they exist, as opposed to what people think is there. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I, one thing that I really want to do that I will do at some point, I just need the right sort of moment is um, you think about films like po po visual poetry um, that are nevertheless incredibly revealing. Some films like Hale County this morning, this evening, Koya Stasi, films like that, you know, um, that don't try to say too much in a specific way, but rather just immerse you and, and present to you and, and, and speak with a very organic voice that I, that I think it, it's just lacking to some degree in, in media today because they, they tend to be whatever art films or arty films. But a lot, of, a lot of some of my favorite films of the last decade have been um, more poetic like that. And I always have little moments like those in, in my films and I just find them to be um, in terms of thinking of a film like a, a symphony or thinking of it like a, like a jazz song or you know piece of music that there's, there's movements and there's ebbs and there's flows. Um, and so I just like to try to incorporate that, that stuff in my film. And um, I, I keep increasingly doing it a little bit more, a little bit more to the point where there is going to be a film one of these days that's like, wow, <laughs> like that, 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 that's different, you know? But um, yeah, it's just beautiful. I like, I like beauty. I like those hidden things you know, that, that are all around us, but we're so busy. We don't take time to notice them or, we're, we're so caught up in, and in, in, in even if we're caught up in fighting for social justice or things that are important to us, we, we often miss the things that are right there in front of us and both, both good and bad. And I think it's important to be reminded of those things um, and have those things uh, framed and presented in, a, in an artistic way. Exactly. Which is one of the reasons why I wanted to um pay note to that and bring it up because I think it is an important visual way to um, address and enhance the storytelling that's being done on film, especially in a film like Homeroom. I wanna close our conversation out with asking, what are you working on next? Mm -hmm. uh, well, it was just announced, so, you know, we're doing a, a film about Steph, Stephen Curry, who's a sort of a local Bay Area. And, you know, I don't know if it fits it, precisely into the trilogy, but it is a Bay Area story. And uh, it's a project that came to us to proximity. Ryan Kugler's producing it, I'm directing it and producing it as well. And um, it's a coming of age story that, that um, is gonna explore his becoming, you know, like before he was Steph Curry, he was a, a undersized player at a small uh, college in North, North Carolina. And, um, you know, it's an expo exploration of, of um, what it, what it means to sort of find your voice. And, you know, we're similar, like he's mixed race, I'm mixed race, we're about the same height. We're both born in Akron. It's very interesting. Cool. I knew you were one of the good ones. Not only are you a bison, but you're from the Midwest too. I'm from Missouri. Oh, Not Ohio, yeah, yeah. but I'm from Missouri. Missouri, Midwest, that's right. We lived Midwest. in Shaker Heights for a minute and then we lived in Boston. <laughs> I knew you were one of the good ones. So I just want to close this out with a couple of quotes that I found that were lovely. Deadline called Homeroom a timely and empowering story that celebrates the courage and tenacity of young people today. And then I found this one moment in the film that I wanted to quote that made me so incredibly happy. One of the subjects says, ain't no power like the power of youth and the youth don't stop. Yeah, Donaldson said that, yeah. So I just wanted to close out our conversation, paying homage to one of the subjects of the film, paying homage to a beautiful quote from a very reputable um, outlet that has given some kind words and homage to your film. I want to wish you well on your next Jerry, Jerry journey. And hopefully I'll get to holla at you when you get that Steph Curry project done so we can talk a little bit about that. Let's do that. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do this, Bison. <laughs> All right. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank you so very much, Pete, for taking time, Mr. Peter Nix, for taking time out to talk to us over here at Film Independent Presents about your documentary film on Homeroom, which can be streamed and seen right now as we are speaking on the Hulu channel. Until the next time, I am your moderator and host, Carla Renata, and I'll see y'all next time. Mm -hmm.